One of our most popular videos asks these questions. Did Marcus Aurelius persecute the Christians? Was Marcus Aurelius a friend or foe of Christianity? To better answer this question, we are reflecting on the biographies of Marcus Aurelius to become better acquainted with this Roman emperor and Stoic philosopher. Our preliminary observation is that history, like relationships, is complicated. Because his meditations contain so many Stoic sayings that parallel the scriptures and teachings of Christianity, many modern Christians deeply desire that he was a friend to Christians. What we have discovered around the writings attributed to and surrounding St. Justin the Martyr is that ancient Christians also want to bring Marcus Aurelius into the Christian camp. Please, we welcome interesting questions in the comments. Let us learn and reflect together. At the end of our talk, we'll discuss the sources used for this video. Please feel free to follow along in the PowerPoint script we uploaded to SlideShare. Marcus Aurelius was the last of the five good emperors of Rome. We have reflected on the prior emperors of Rome, in particular these five good emperors. Marcus Aurelius and the provincial governors mainly followed the precedence of prior emperors when conducting the Christian persecutions. We will also examine the history of the Christian persecutions through the reign of Marcus Aurelius and the meditations of Marcus Aurelius. The biographies of Marcus Aurelius also contain valuable information on the ordinary life of Romans and the ancient warrior culture in Rome. We will also reflect on the biography of his son and successor, Commodus. And what was it like to be a young Marcus Aurelius? Varus, the father of Marcus, died when he was three. His mother did not remarry. In his meditations, he praised her reverence for the divine, her generosity, her inability not only to do wrong, but to even conceive of doing wrong, and the simple way she lived, not least like the rich. And he was raised by his rich grandfather, but the Emperor Hadrian was a frequent visitor and became fond of the young Marcus, taking interest both in his education and involving him in the Roman priesthood. Since Adrian had no heirs, he adopted as his successor Marcus Aurelius. But soon before his death, he decided to also adopt a relative, Antoninus Pius, as his son and immediate successor. Hadrian insisted that Antoninus Pius would, in turn, adopt as his sons both young Marcus Aurelius and Lucius Versus, and Marcus Aurelius would be assigned as emperor to succeed him, guaranteeing a smooth succession for two generations. Marcus likely moved into the palace sometime in his youth, likely after Hadrian had put him into the line of succession. The Roman Empire under these good emperors was at its peak, ranging from Syria to Spain and from England to Egypt. The historian Will Durant states, Never was a boy so persistently educated. He was attached in boyhood to the services of temples and priests. He committed to memory every word of the ancient and unintelligible liturgy, and this may be overstated, and though philosophy later shook his faith, it never diminished his sedulous performance in the old exacting ritual. And Marcus studied under 17 tutors, including Stoic philosophers, jurists, grammarians, and rhetoricians. From an early age, Marcus was a serious Stoic philosopher, as Will Durant says. At the age of 12, he took on the rude cloak of a philosopher, slept on a little straw strewn over the floor, and long resisted the entreaties of his mother to use a couch. He was a Stoic before he became a man. The historian McLean recorded some Stoic lessons Marcus learned from his tutors. Apollonius taught that nothing mattered except the purity of Stoic doctrine, and that a man should be the same in all circumstances, indifferent both to worldly success and to pain, illness, or the loss of a child. His tutor Severus believed in the freedom of speech, equality before the law, and enlightened rulers. He preached the love of family, truth, and justice, the value of helping others, and the joys of sharing and the merits of optimism. And in his philosophy, Marcus Aurelius favored the philosophy of Epictetus, but denigrated the philosophy of Seneca. Maximus taught these lessons. You must master yourself, keep your personality in balance, and combine dignity and grace. You should be cheerful in all circumstances, particularly when ill, and do your job without complaining. You should be generous, charitable, honest, sincere, and forgiving. Marcus said that Maximus was a man who always spoke without malice, but who said exactly what he thought. He was imperturbable and unshockable, was never apprehensive, and never taken aback. He was never rash, hesitant, bewildered, or at a loss. Never hung back from a task. Was never downcast or fawningly hypocritical. Never obsequious, but not aggressive or paranoid either. His teacher Rusticus taught him, and he would later be responsible for the martyrdom of St. Justin the Martyr. And in the words of McLean, 
Rustica said that to live the life of a philosopher was not a matter of showy austerity, wearing hair shirts, sleeping rough, or wearing a philosopher's cloak, but simply knowing how to live well. In theory, an emperor could do that as well as a shepherd. And Marcus Aurelius and Pius, in effect, served as co-emperors. Antoninus Pius persuaded Marcus to break his current engagement to marry his daughter Faustina in the year 145 AD. Although Faustina gained a reputation for infidelity, Marcus never complained, thanking the gods for a wife that was so obedient, so warm-hearted, and so artless. She bore him 15 children, although only six survived to adulthood. And Marcus was a virtual co-emperor with Antoninus Pius for the final 13 and a half years of his reign. He served as a consul and actively participated in drafting legislation for the Senate, ensuring a smooth transition on the passing of Antoninus. Did Marcus Aurelius or Antoninus Pius read a remarkable apology to the emperor addressed and delivered to them from St. Justin the Martyr? He sought to show how both the Old Testament and the Greco-Roman moral philosophers both point to and are fulfilled by the coming of Christ in the world. He may have gone too far by attacking the moral bankruptcy of the myths surrounding the gods and the deification of emperors by Roman standards. History is silent on whether either emperor saw this apology. We do know that Fronto, a tutor of Marcus, criticized the incestuous banquets of the Christians, showing a misunderstanding of Christianity. St. Justin Martyr traveled to Rome during the reign of Antoninus Pius and started a school. Tatian was one of his students. During the reign of Marcus Aurelius, after a debate with the Cynic philosopher Crescens, he was denounced to the authorities. He and his companions were martyred when they refused to sacrifice to the gods. Since the prosecutor of the case, Rusticus, was an old friend and mentor of Marcus Aurelius, it was likely that the emperor was informed about this case. Marcus Aurelius was only absent from the palace for two nights during the reign of Antoninus Pius. Wilderant stated that when Emperor Pius, in declining health, desired a colleague to share the government with him, he named Marcus only, and then left to Lucius the empire of love. On the death of Antoninus, Marcus became sole emperor, but remembering Hadrian's wish, he at once made Lucius Verus his full colleague and gave him his daughter Lucia in marriage. At the outset of his reign, as at the end, the philosopher erred through kindness. Now Marcus Aurelius began his reign as the last good emperor, auspiciously, with acclaim. Wilderant noted that he paid the Senate every courtesy. All Italy and all the provinces acclaimed him as Plato's dream come true. The philosopher was king. Although he insisted that Lucius Verus be named co-emperor, Marcus had the greater authority since he was the chief priest of Rome. But Wilderan also criticized his rule. Marcus Aurelius was not a great statesman. He spent too much of the public funds and cash gifts to the people and to the army, gave free corn to more citizens, and provided frequent and costly games, and remitted large sums in unpaid taxes and tributes. In hindsight, Durant can say this, but the truth is our emperor faced more serious challenges than did most emperors before him. Early in his reign, Marcus Aurelius faced major military attacks, first from Parthian Persia, then from formerly friendly German tribes that rebelled, and some invaded northern Italy, which had not happened since Hannibal's elephants crossed the Alps many centuries ago. When the army returned from Parthia, they brought with them the plague, which scholars estimate decimated 10% of the population in the empire. At its worst, the plague was killing 2,000 people a day in Rome, including many of the aristocracy. The cities in the Roman army suffered the worst. Who was to blame for the plague? We remember how in the Iliad, the priest Chrysus prayed to Apollo to send a plague upon the Greeks for refusing to release his daughter Chryseis. Likewise, many Romans, fearful of the plague, suspected the Christians, who refused to sacrifice to the gods, but were rather hostile towards the god and many Romans thought they may have caused the plague by angering the gods. Although the most vigorous persecutions were in the provinces, there were persecutions in Rome itself, including the martyrdom of St. Justin the Martyr. What challenges did Marcus Aurelius face in the first year of his reign? First was one of the worst floodings of the Tiber River in Rome, destroying many buildings, drowning many animals, leaving famine in its wake. And second, Parthia and Persia opened hostilities against Rome. And third, though it was seen as a blessing at the time, Marcus's wife, Faustina, gave birth to twins. Although the omens were favorable, she dreamed she was giving birth to serpents, and their birthday was the same as the murderous Emperor Caligula, and Commodus was the twin who survived. And what about the trouble in Persia with the rebellion of the Parthians? In prior conflicts, Roman emperors had invaded Persia to defeat Parthia. Emperor Trajan had invaded, making the kingdom of Armenia a Roman province. 
but his successor Hadrian decided to retreat to more defensible borders, and he granted Armenia independence, making them a client kingdom that paid Rome tribute. While Hadrian visited the provinces, the aging Antoninus Pius ruled from Rome, also maintaining the status quo. Then Marcus Aurelius, praised as a philosopher king, assumed the duties of emperor. Now the aggressive king Volgaces IV of Persia was not impressed. A decade earlier, he had seized Roman client states in Lower Mesopotamia. He conquered the Roman client state of Armenia, massacring a Roman legion. Then the Parthians invaded Syria, defeating the Roman governor, who fled. Simultaneously, there was also trouble in Britain and Germania. Since Antoninus Pius wanted to keep Marcus Aurelius under his thumb, possibly to assure his security as ruler, neither he nor Varus, for all their education, had any military training. Also, you cannot gain battlefield experience in a peaceful empire. Since Lucius Varus was younger and in better health, he was sent to the east to command the troops in person. He was assigned the crack legions and the best equipment available. But Lucius took his time, hunting and carousing as he went, at last finding his way into Antioch, which would be the Roman military base for the next four years. Will Durant notes that in Antioch, Lucius met an oriental beauty named Panthea, Lucius saw her and, like Gilgamesh, forgot where he was born. He abandoned himself to pleasure, to hunting, and at last to debauchery, while the Parthians rode into terror-stricken Syria. Fortunately, Varus had one strength. He was a good delegator. He allowed the Roman army to fight and win the war. In Rome, Marcus Aurelius monitored the situation and decided on a two-front strategy. On one front, he sent the best generals of the Roman army to Syria, and on the other front, he sent his daughter Lucia who had been promised to Lucius Verus in marriage to the east, where they were married in pomp and ceremony in Ephesus. She had recently turned 14 and was eligible for marriage. Both fronts of this struggle were a success. The invasion of Parthia in 164 AD was meticulously planned. The army discipline had grown lax, and they were put through a boot camp and retrained. Verus did participate in the planning of the invasion, but left the execution to the generals of the two invading Roman legions. On the second front, Lucia acquired the title Augusta, and the couple soon bore three children in succession, although history is silent on whether she banished Panthea. Wilderant summarizes the war. Marcus made no comment on Lucius, but sent to Avidius Cassius, second in charge to Lucius's army, a plan of campaign whose military excellence helped the general's own ability not only to drive the Parthians back across Mesopotamia, but to plant the Roman standards once more in Seleucia and the Cestaphon, cities near Babylon on the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. This time the two cities were burned to the ground. Lucius returned from Antioch to Rome and was awarded a triumph, which he magnanimously insisted that Marcus should share. While this was happening, Marcus Aurelius was reigning as emperor in Rome. In a prior reflection, I was hoping that the reason why the Christians were persecuted in Rome during the reign of Marcus Aurelius was that he was distracted fighting the Germanic tribes. But unfortunately, including when he was de facto emperor in the last years of the reign of Antoninus Pius, Marcus Aurelius ruled as residing emperor in Rome for about two decades. During his time in Rome, Marcus Aurelius was an able administrator and ruler. Marcus attended the Senate sessions, sometimes suggesting legislation. He decreed that the Senate hear appeals from decisions of the consuls. He was prudent in state expenditures and discouraged false accusations. And sometimes he was personally involved in hearing cases and appeals. Marcus Aurelius, living up to his stoic ideals, had these three interests, according to Anthony Burley. Manumission or liberation of slaves, appointment of guardians for orphans and minors, and selection of counselors to administer local communities in the provinces. Antoninus Pius had made a master liable for the murder of his slave, which was remarkable for the ancient world, and the law was interpreted liberally to free slaves when possible. Sometimes Marcus Aurelius forced a cruel master to sell his slave to another kinder master. Over the centuries and millennia, the Old Testament prophets, rabbis, Christian fathers, and Stoic philosophers, and in particular Seneca and Marcus Aurelius, slowly improved a lot of the lowest class of laborers, which were the slaves in the ancient world. Marcus Aurelius was not fond of gladiatorial contests. They were quite popular with the populace, so the rulers dared not abolish them. Even St. Augustine, centuries later, was complaining about these bloody contests long after the Roman Empire became Christian. 
Will Durant said that Marcus Aurelius forbade extravagant remuneration to actors and gladiators, restricted the expenditures of cities on games, required the use of foiled weapons in gladiatorial contests, and did all that sanguinary custom would allow to banish death from the arena. An unintended consequence of a decree to decrease the cost of these gladiatorial games, and that was reducing the number of gladiators by reducing their fees, was the substitution of other condemned men, such as the Christians, to die in the arena. Soon after the victory over Parthia, the Germanic tribes on the northern frontier put aside their differences, formed a secret alliance, and rebelled against Rome. Perhaps they wanted to take advantage of Roman losses from the plague. Will Durant summarizes the start of the conflict. The Germanic tribes overwhelmed a Roman garrison of 20,000 men. Some made their way over the Alps, had defeated every army sent against them, were besieging Aquila near Venice, and were threatening Verona, and were laying waste to the rich fields of northern Italy. Never before had the German tribes moved with such unity or so closely threatened Rome. But the historian Anthony Burley comments that part of their motivation was pressure from wilder Germanic tribesmen to the far north that many of them invaded merely to settle, not to raid and plunder. Durant continues, Marcus acted with surprising decisiveness. He put away the pleasures of philosophy and determined to take the field in what he foresaw would be the most momentous of Roman wars since Hannibal. He shocked Italy by enrolling policemen, gladiators, slaves, brigands, and barbarian mercenaries into legions depleted by war and pestilence. Even the gods were conscripted with sacrifices to protect Romans. With both Marcus Aurelius and Lucius Verus departing from the front, Lucius fell ill from food poisoning, dying a few days later. Some scholars debate whether he died from smallpox or plague. And despite their differences, Marcus gave him a state funeral, deifying him. Will Durant describes this military struggle. Despite a hundred defeats, the fertile barbarians were growing stronger and the barren Romans weaker. And perhaps Durant here is revealing to us more about his sensibilities than he reveals about Roman history. But he does correctly state that Marcus saw that it was now a war to the death, that one side must destroy the other or go under. Only a man schooled in the Roman and Stoic sense of duty could have transformed himself so completely from a mystic philosopher into a competent and successful emperor. The war with the initially unified Germanic tribes lasted a long, bloody seven years. This war was fought on a front from the Danube to the Black Sea. The war was brutal. Marcus built a column in Rome showing captured warriors being beheaded, the torching of villages, rape of women, seizures of cattle, killing of infants. But these brutal reprisals were only exacted against the most recalcitrant foes. Marcus Aurelius preferred to treat surrendering tribes with magnanimity, sometimes resettling them, sometimes pruning the warriors to serve in Roman legions and other theaters of war. Calling this a battle against barbarians oversimplifies the struggle. These Germanic tribes had become more and more Romanized as they interacted with Rome ever since Emperor Augustus campaigned there. Marcus Aurelius and the army played the long game, striking only when advantageous, defeating the tribes one by one. Although the Germanic tribes fought more effectively by adopting some Roman tactics, their warrior culture demanded that their armies attack the strongest part of the Roman line, making them easier to defeat. But what is an aborted coup among friends? One of the most bizarre and puzzling episodes in ancient history was the attempted coup by Marcus's trusted general, Avidius Cassius, whom he posted in the east while he was busy fighting the Germanic tribes. The emperor heard of the coup while arranging the final peace settlement with a major Germanic tribe and had to hurry the negotiations, to Rome's detriment, to deal with this crisis. Avidius Cassius did not respect Marcus Aurelius. As the historian MacLean puts it, although claiming to find Marcus the best of men, Avidius seems to have despised him for weakness. Marcus tried to make a virtue of being merciful in the wrong context. He constantly pardoned the unpardonable. As for his Stoic philosophy, that was at best an eccentricity and at worst an abomination. Who needed an emperor who meditated on philosophical principles instead of the interests of the state? It was not philosophy Rome needed, but practical wisdom, and above all, the sword. Does this condemnation of Stoicism ring true? Perhaps there's a grain of truth in this, and perhaps Marcus wanted to be too lenient with Cassius. But what we do know is that because of his magnanimity and living his stoic virtues in practice, Marcus had very few enemies in the Senate and in the army. But he perhaps had one enemy in the army and one in his household. Since we care as much about learning his stoic virtues as his history, we will let Cassius Dio tell the story, although it is a bit lengthy. 
and both are modern historians, McLean and Burley use this account as a primary source for this fantastic history. Cassius Dio tells us that his trusted general Cassius was an excellent man and the sort one would desire to have as an emperor. But Cassius was deceived by Faustina, who, seeing that her husband had fallen ill and was near death, was afraid that the troops might fall to some outsider, as Commodus was both too young and also rather simple-minded. Our modern historians claim she sought to protect the throne for her son, but we must ask ourselves, was she concerned about her son's fitness for the throne? Cassius Dio continues, Faustina secretly induced Cassius to make his preparations so that, if anything should happen to her husband, he might obtain both her and the imperial power. Just then a message came that Marcus was dead, and immediately, without waiting to confirm the rumor, he laid claim to the throne. Although he soon learned the whole truth, he did not change his course, and was preparing to seize the throne. Marcus, on being informed of his uprising to dispel rumors, addressed his troops. Fellow soldiers, I have come before you, not to express indignation, but to bewail my fate. For why become angry at heaven, which is all-powerful? But it is necessary, perhaps, for those who meet with undeserved misfortune to indulge in lamentations. Now that is my case. Is it not dreadful that we became engaged in war upon war? Is it not horrible that we are even involved in civil war? Are not both these evils surpassed in dreadfulness and horror by the discovery that there is no such thing as loyalty among men? Marcus continues his speech. There is only one thing I fear, fellow soldiers, for you shall be told the whole truth. And that is, either Cassius will kill himself because he is ashamed to come into our presence, or that someone else will do so upon learning that I am already sending out against him. For then I shall be deprived of such a great prize, both of war and of victory, a prize such as no human being has ever yet obtained. And what is this prize? To forgive a man who has wronged one, to remain a friend to one who has transgressed friendship, to continue faithful to one who has broken faith. And Marcus Aurelius continues, Hopefully I can settle this fair and tell to all mankind that there's a right way to deal even with civil wars. And this is what Marcus said both to the soldiers and wrote to the Senate, never abusing Cassius in any way, save that he constantly termed him ungrateful. Nor indeed did Cassius ever write or utter anything insulting to Marcus. While Marcus was preparing for the civil war, the death of Cassius was reported to him at the same time with the news of many victories over various barbarians. Cassius had encountered Antonius, a centurion, who suddenly wounded him in the neck. When he died, they cut off Cassius' head and sent it to the emperor. Cassius Dio continues, Marcus, upon reaching the provinces that had joined Cassius' rebelling, treated them all very leniently and did not put anyone to death, whether obscure or prominent. This same emperor neither slew nor imprisoned nor put under guard any of the senators who had been associated with Cassius. Indeed, he did not so much as bring them before his own court, but merely sent them before the Senate, as though charged with some other offense, and set a definite day for their trial. Of the others, he executed a very few. What about Faustina, the empress who had been involved in the coup against her husband? Cassius Dio tells us. About the same time, Faustina also died, either of the gout, from which she suffered, or in some other manner. Suicide, maybe? in order to avoid being convicted of her compact with Cassius. And yet Marcus destroyed all the papers that were found in her chests without reading any of them, in order that he might not learn even the name of any of the conspirators who had written anything against him, and so be reluctantly forced to hate them. Ferris found papers among the effects of Cassius and destroyed them, remarking that this course would probably be the most agreeable to the emperor, and perhaps so he wouldn't sully the reputation of his deceased mother. Cassius Dio then says, in his great grief over the death of Faustina, Marcus wrote to the Senate asking that no one of those who had cooperated with Cassius should be put to death. He said, May it never happen that any of you should be slain during my reign, either by my vote or by yours. So pure and excellent and God-fearing did he show himself from first to last, that nothing could force him to do anything inconsistent with his character, neither the wickedness of their rash course, nor the expectation of similar uprisings as a result of his pardoning these rebels. So far indeed was he from inventing any imaginary conspiracy or concocting any tragedy that had really not occurred, that he actually released those who had, in the most open manner, risen against him and taken up arms both against him and against his son, and he put none of them to death. Hence I verily believe that if he had captured Cassius himself alive, he certainly would have spared his life. And what were the last days of Marcus Aurelius? 
Marcus Aurelius returned to Rome triumphantly. Historians criticize him for not attempting to expand the frontiers of the Roman Empire, but that was what he was planning to do when he once again embarked with his armies to the northern frontiers. He was going to expand the northern borders to make the empire more defensible over the long run. Summarizing his life, Cassius Dio tells us that Marcus Aurelius did not display many feats of physical prowess, yet he had developed his body from a very weak one to one capable of the greatest endurance. Most of his life he devoted to beneficence, and that was the reason, perhaps, for his erecting a temple to beneficence in the capital. Cassius Dio continues, He himself then refrained from all offenses and did nothing amiss, whether voluntary or involuntarily. But the offenses of others, particularly those of his wife, he tolerated, and neither inquired into them nor punished them. So long as the person did anything good, he would praise him and use him for the service in which he excelled. But as to the other conduct, he paid no attention. And he declared that it is impossible for one to create such men as one desires to have. So it is fitting to employ those who are already in existence for whatever service each of them may be able to render to the state. In the latter days of his reign, Marcus Aurelius attempted to provide his son Commodus with as good a Stoic education as he had received, but his son was the worst student imaginable. However, he still appointed him as co-regent in the last years of his reign, rather than adopting a more competent colleague to succeed him. Upon his father's death, Commodus called off the Germanic Wars, quickly negotiated a peace settlement, and returned to Rome to carouse and torment senators and ordinary Romans, and fight with gladiators in the arena. Like Nero, he was eventually assassinated by a conspiracy of both his Praetorian Guard and several senators. Like Nero, his reign was followed by another year of six emperors, destabilizing the Roman Empire. Commodus destroyed the Senate, and he came close to destroying the Roman Empire, and he destroyed his father's legacy. We will conclude with our video, Did Emperor Marcus Aurelius Actively Persecute the Christians? And what were the sources we used for this video? Many lecturers on the five good Roman emperors complain about the lack of ancient historians and biographers that are the equal of Plutarch, but that does not mean that the historical sources do not exist, but that they are less reliable and must be cross-checked and verified as much as possible by modern historians. And this biography by Frank McLean is over 500 pages long, and half of this book is on extensive background discussions. We are also using this biography for our videos on Roman emperors preceding Marcus Aurelius, videos on Christian persecutions, ordinary life in Roman times, and ancient warrior cultures in Roman times, and a biography of his son and cruel successor, Commodus. He also discusses the historical background of the struggles in Parthia and Germania. The biography by Anthony Burley is also informative. He has a different perspective. He has excellent appendices extensively discussing the ancient sources used to reconstruct the life of Marcus Aurelius and the Christian persecutions which is a source for this our ending discussion. Although it is dated, written in 1944, Wilderance History, Caesar and Christ, also is a rich source of history and background, and he is very quotable and an excellent writer. And also, like the ancient historians, he tries to draw moral lessons from history. Marcus Aurelius wrote his meditations while fighting the Marco-Manic Wars in Germania. We like the translation in the Dover Thrift Edition, and we found the translation in the Stoic Six Pack on Amazon to be unintelligible. And the Meditations is one of the classic texts of ancient Stoicism and contains several references to Christianity. And the most treasured ancient source is Cassius Dio, who was a Roman senator. He had access to the official records of the Senate. He wrote an 80 volume history of Rome, starting from its founding in the years of the Roman Republic through Emperor Severus, shortly after Marcus Aurelius. Unfortunately for the last 20 books in the series, there remains only fragments in the meager abridgment of a Byzantine monk from the 11th century. His histories are available online, and they are more complete for the period during and after the Marcomannic Wars in Germania. Also, there is the ambitious Historia Augusta, where multiple ancient authors recount Roman history, starting with Emperor Hadrian. Much of this history is fabricated and should be cross-checked with other sources when possible. One quirky source is the two-way correspondence between Marcus Aurelius and his tutor Fronto, which continued into his years as emperor. Although he was not Marcus's most influential tutor, they are another direct mirror into the mind of Marcus Aurelius, and they take up an incredible two volumes in the classical Loeb Library. Other minor sources are legal compilations, such as the Code of Justinian, works by the orator Aelius Aristides, 
in comments by the physician Galen, and Herodian, and of course coins, inscriptions, and papyri. In addition, we'll be discussing the other sources used for the history of the Christian persecutions in our video pondering. Did the Stoic Emperor Marcus Aurelius actively persecute Christians? The YouTube description includes a link to our PowerPoint script that we uploaded to SlideShare and also our blog. Please support this channel by sharing this video with your friends and by clicking on the like and subscribe buttons and by clicking on the Amazon links to purchase any of the books we discussed, which will earn us a very small affiliate commission. And please consider becoming a patron of our channel. Plus, we will host special discussion groups for our patrons. Plus, you can click on the meetup or small M icon to participate in our online discussions where we practice our future YouTube scripts. And please click on the links for other videos that will broaden your knowledge and improve your soul.